Good evening. Uh, my name is Jim Chase. Uh, I come to you tonight um, as a parent, uh, a taxpayer, uh, as a grandparent. I have six children. Uh, I have seven grandchildren. And more on the way. And you guys heard part of this because uh, we were in Baldwinsville. And uh, I, um, as, a, as a parent, I sit here and I wonder, and I have been wondering for several years right now, that where the disconnect came in Albany, where the parent was left out of the mix here because our parents are first teachers. It starts there, it starts at home. They are the first teachers. They stay with their kids, hopefully, throughout their entire education. And they are partners in this. They are partners with the teachers. They are partners with the school district. And they should be partners with their legislators. None of these people should be victims. And unfortunately, they become victims. You know, the, the parents. Uh, my uh, daughter called me the other night. She had, uh, uh, my uh, granddaughter had a math problem, and I didn't write it down. I'm sorry, I wasn't as astute as that. But, you know, it, uh, I handed the phone to my wife because I, I am a teacher as well. I, I teach global studies. Um, at Adirondack. I'm also the uh, president of the Adirondack Teachers Association as well. So what I'm doing is I'm seeing all this from all the sides and she asked me the question and when when uh, my older children were growing up I took care of the English and the social studies. My wife who's a medical technologist, the chief medical technologist right now and licensed you know uh, nationally as well, certified nationally. Uh, she took care of the science and the math, and I handed the phone over to my wife. My wife handed it back to me and said, you're the teacher. Um, and when my wife can't answer a math question, we're in trouble. You, you know, as far as I, you know, I'm concerned. And, and I'm very much, uh, you know, I, I extremely uh, thankful as I was in Baldwinsville uh, when, I, when I was able to speak there, that uh, the individuals that were there, uh, two of which are right here tonight, were similar to you, uh, all of you that are here, and you actually listened. I was at Whitesboro, um, and I had the uh, opportunity, I didn't speak there, I listened, uh, but I did, see a gentleman come up to the microphone with uh, some websites that I was familiar with. He had a laptop in his hand. And uh, uh, I want to deal with your question here about um, education. Where is the crisis? I'm here to tell you as a parent, as a taxpayer, as a teacher, there isn't a crisis in education. All right? There's a crisis in government. All right, a big crisis in government. All right, when I see Arnie Duncan, our Secretary of Education, dodging questions on the Bill Maher show on HBO and dodging questions on PBS, I'm, I'm asking where, you know, where did this guy come from? And the other thing that, that's really bothersome to me as a parent and a taxpayer is it seems like the farther we go in education, uh, especially in public education right now, uh, I have no real experience in private education, I'm going to tell you that. Uh, all of my children are products, either are now or have been or still are because I'm still paying for them. And, college and grad school, and I'm sure a lot of you have done the same. Um, I'm, just, I'm just very, very curious as to why the farther we move up, the less educational experience we have. 
And it bothers me to no end, frankly, uh, that we are led in the State Ed Department by a group of individuals that have little or no in the classroom educational experience. You know, it, it bothers me as a parent, it bothers me as a teacher. And as a uh, union leader, I keep telling my, my, uh, uh, my colleagues that they have, to, they have to keep pushing, they have to keep working ahead, and, and we're doing as much time as we can. But I, I've got to tell you right now that, that this has to come to an end. Um, in every major website you go to, whether it's in this state or in this nation or in the world, New York State education is valued. They're either first or second all the way around. And that gentleman in Whitesboro, which I would say we were at Whitesboro, the, the audience there that I estimate was around 1,000 or 1,200 people were met by, in my estimation, an extremely hostile group of individuals sitting where you are right now. Uh, that actually uh, at, at one point was scolding the crowd because the crowd was unhappy with the answers that they were getting from the commissioner because the only thing the commissioner would say would let me be clear and then nothing was clear all right and he probably said that I counted at least 12 times let me be clear and there wasn't anything clear how can a gentleman and I'm sure he's a very learned man uh, he espoused all his degrees, and um, I certainly didn't go to Harvard or Yale or wherever the Ivy League schools he was. I spent my time in SUNY schools, and so did my kids, uh, the ones that are older. Uh, but I got to tell you, every single one of them are public school graduates, and every single I'm, I'm going to watch my son in a month graduate from law school. You know, my my oldest son, and. Uh, he went from public school to the U.S. Marine Corps, uh, served his country, uh, is still serving his country, uh, and at the same time, he got his master's degree and then went on and he's finishing up his law degree. And that was all starting right here in New York State, like every single one of my kids, all right? My grandchildren, my mom and dad went to schools right here in New York State. You know, and, and I don't believe there's, there's a crisis here. Um, can there always be improvement? Absolutely. There is always going to be improvement. And are there some rays of improvement uh, embedded someplace in the Common Core? Yeah, I'm sure they are. But I got to tell you right now, uh, they are far outweighed uh, by the damage that it's doing to our kids. Um, I'm watching 14 and 50 year old kids not coming to school anymore. So they don't want to be there. And, and i got to tell you right now that as a parent and as a teacher, the one thing we have to do is we have to support our kids. All right? And we have to help them see the purpose for going to school. All right? And that purpose is so they can become contributing members of our society. Life skills, I believe, is the way you described it, Assembly Butler. Um, that's, that's what our real goal is here. And whether they're electricians, whether they're plumbers, my brother is a master plumber, you know, and, and he makes a good dollar doing it in the Rochester area. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, we need plumbers. We need welders. We need electricians. And as you say, not everybody can be nuclear physicists, but we need a few of them as well. And we've got some coming through if we make sure we paid attention uh, to the science end of this aspect as well, like Rob Wood was talking about. But we need, what we really need right now is we need legislature and the legislators to step up as statesmen, as public servants, which you people are doing, all right? I'm sorry to say not everyone is doing. You know, and that 1% that we always hear that controls all the money, the Bill Gates, you know, the Steve Jobs, and I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to malign a man that's, that's deceased, but I got to tell you right now, if we could do a Regents exam and how to text with those two thumbs, you know, I don't think any kid 
uh, would fail that exam, you know, uh, especially with the iPods or anything like that. You want to pass some laws, do the teachers a favor and start banning them from school grounds or something like that, you know. Um, that would be one of, the, one of the favors that we could do because we're always battling the cell phones and the iPods and everything else under the sun. But, but that's, that's all part of life. All right, that's all part of life. And, and what we need to do is, is we need to support our kids, we need to support our teachers. And we are going to support you people. But there's one thing I am going to say, and I've heard you say it a couple of times, several of you say it. In a year, there's going to be an election. And I can tell you, I personally, and I believe every person in this room, I would hope, all right, we have finally begun to woke up, wake up, excuse me, all right? Um, it's like a um, description of the uh, Admiral, uh, Admiral Yamamoto, uh, right after the attack on Pearl Harbor. When he said in his, in his memoirs that what he, what he feared is all that they had done by the attack on Pearl Harbor is wake up a sleeping giant. And I gotta tell you right now, this state legislature what they've done is they're waking up the sleeping giant and what we are going to do is we may be part of the 99% all right and the 1% may have the money but things we are going to do we are going to vote and we are going to vote for the people that are our statesmen our public servants not the politicians that count on the Pearsons and all the other co corporations to make sure their coffers are filled so they can run for re-election. And I liked your remark, uh, Assemblyman Graff in particular, when you said, uh, we were talking right after in Baldinsville, when you said you really didn't care whether you got re-elected or not. You know, that you were there to serve the people. And that, that's the measure of a statesman. All right, that's the measure. Those are the kind of people that we need in our state legislature. And where's Andrew Cuomo? I could tell you where he is. He's behind the curtain pulling all the strings. We should probably change his name to Oz. All right, because he's this little guy in there that thinks that he's got all the answers and so on until somebody finally pulls the drape across and sees exactly what we're dealing with. All right, we're dealing with somebody that's got an extremely high opinion of themselves, all right, and whose opinion from out here is slinking all the time, in my opinion. All right, but not just them, the other ones as well. All right. So I, I leave with you this. One, we need to repeal the Common Core. We need to do that, and we need to do that as soon as we can. All right? We also need to repeal Educational Law 3012C, which is your APPR, because it's absolutely ridiculous that we're judging teachers that can't even make up their final exams, can't see them beforehand, don't even get to grade them, all right, but we're being judged on them, all right? And our elementary teachers, I spend probably the majority of my time as a union leader with elementary teachers, and they're at their wit's end because these modules, you know, they just, and, and, Unfortunately, I, I think uh, that we've taken the, well, the state says we have to do it, so we have to do it. And the problem is, is the question, you know, we could do this, we can do this, how can we do this? And I think you're seeing elementary teachers across the, the state of New York, whether it be down in your neck of the woods in Long Island or up where I live in the North Country, where, by the way, it's snowing when I came down. <laughs> Um, please, please, let's put these things to the side and let's get back uh, to, to trusting the professionals. We're fingerprinting teachers. You know, we're, we're, we're doing criminal background checks. You know, we're, we're doing all these things here. You know, and, and now what we're doing is we're, we're not only 
judging them on the content of what's going on here. We're judging them on how they dress, how they look, uh, how many times they show up in the hallway, uh, you know, how many meetings they go to, uh, how long do they spend at these meetings. You know, you know, teachers right now are at their wit's end. And parents are at their wit's end. We need some help. Let me ask you. Sure. Uh, your representative, and another thing we were talking about is teachers that get their special ed certification. Mm -hmm. And there are some kids that are developmentally, they're here. But Common Core expects them to be here. Mm -hmm. But there's no way they can ever get there because of their disability. And here's one of my fears, too, is that if we're going to judge teachers that are working with our most disabled children and trying to get them to, you know, function in the world as far as, you know, count money so they don't get ripped off, be able to take the bus where they have to go, maybe be able to get some kind of job set so they can get an, a, a job in order to mainstream them a little bit so that they can live in, in the community and stuff. And these are highly, I mean, in my experience, these are teachers that really put themselves out, you know, for heartache and everything else when it comes to kids with real disabilities. But if they know that they're going to be judged, okay, in a classroom, that, you know, they were ne never able to get those students to hear, right, why would anybody go and get their certification for special ed? You're absolutely correct, and I'll go one step farther. I had to spend several weeks this fall, all right, because a number of the teachers that you're talking about in the special needs areas received absolutely no points on the last 20. Why? Because their children were being judged, their students. And I say children at the same time because I don't know of a teacher that doesn't think of their students as their children as well. I treat them just like I would treat my own kids. But those teachers received no points. And I had to sit down and, and we had to work out a solution to that because that's wrong. That's morally wrong, that's ethically wrong. And the thing that, that seems to be coming out here is what's moral and ethical isn't necessarily legal. But let me tell you right now, what's legal is not necessarily moral and ethical. And the common core all right, and the APPR, the PDP, and every single other set of initials that we've invented here, all right, they're not fair either. You, you know what I mean? There's, when, when we have to start inventing initials upon initials upon initials, you've got to let the people do their jobs, let the professionals. You know, how many of those people are walking into a surgeon, my wife, had brain surgery, unfortunately, seven years ago. You know, and uh, right here in upstate New York, in one of our teaching hospitals, I might add, that I know that the governor would like to see at least some of them closed in the New York City area, if not all of them, which I think is absolutely ludicrous. All right, but we sat there for days not knowing whether or not we were going to celebrate my wife's birthday or bury her. You know, I didn't stand over that surgeon's shoulder and look and see what he was doing and ask him a bunch of questions. I just asked him to take good care of my wife. And I think that's what the parents are doing right now in this state, is they're asking teachers to get, take good care of their children. And we're trying, but it's like swimming up Niagara Falls right now, ladies and gentlemen. It's like swimming up Niagara Falls with what we have to work with. And I'm asking you, you know, I, I'm pleading with you, please. You know, and I know it's across the aisle, and I know they may have, or they think they have the majority, but please help us remind them. Come election day next year, we're going to remember the ones that are the statesmen and the ones that are the public servants, and we're going to remember the ones that are the politicians. All right, the ones that give the term politician a name that you'd like to go wash your mouth out with soap after you say it. And thank God for you people, okay? And I hope we can elect as many of you people as possible next fall. And I hope everybody in this room 
will work as hard as they can to make sure that happens. Thank you very much. A quick co comment, Mr. Chase. I, I was familiar with the quote you used of Admiral Yamamoto, but I prefer the one by the American Admiral who uh, said after Pearl Harbor, when the shooting starts, they call on the sons of bitches. That's why we brought Alan Ray here, so. Uh. <laughs> I didn't want to use that quote because it's questionable language, sir. And I've been known, I've been known in the town of few of those. But I thank you for your time, and I thank you for being here. And please do what you can as the statesmen and the public servants that you are. And remind the rest of them, we're watching. All right? And you're either going to come over to this side where they should be, all right, or maybe you can go find something else. Chase a few ambulances, bury a few people. You know, I did whatever their profession was at one time or another. All right, but they certainly don't deserve to be in the same seats with you people. Take care. Uh, petition to the governor here. There's cards outside. It's got my ugly mug on it, <laughs> and it says "Fix NY Schools." Dot com. Please go on there. The more, the merrier. We're over 18,000 signatures. To the governor. One other thing in passing, if I may. Go ahead. All right. With all the pullout programs that we're doing right now, I'm going to quote one of my colleagues who's, I believe, so. Lauren, are you still here? No, maybe not. Uh, one of my colleagues looked and said, maybe if we're lucky with all the pullouts and the group grading, and you, do you know how degrading it is for a teacher not to be able to grade your own exams? You know, what are we, thieves? You know, that's, that's a problem. But what she said was, is maybe if we're lucky, after all the pullouts and the group grading and everything else, maybe we can really start teaching somewhere around January and February. You know, somewhere's there about it. To see where the kids need work. We see them after the kids get them. Right. And uh, one of the things, the point of a test is not real, it's to judge the, the teacher, it's to give you, it's a tool. The way I was taught, a test is a tool to see if I got the concept through to the kids or not. And a test gives me the ability to say, okay, these children got it, but these children didn't. And it gives me an opportunity to go back and reteach it to those children so they don't lose that building block. I, we perverted what tests are for. And, I mean, in Plattsburgh, you know, that's what they, and that was a SUNY school too. Yeah. But Plattsburgh, they taught us that the purpose of the test, right, was to help us teach. It wasn't to just sit there and put a kid into a box and say, you failed, so sad. You know, it, the, it gave us an opportunity to judge ourselves. And, and as a teacher, you're always evaluating yourself. You're always evaluating your lesson plans. And I just think that the concept that, you know, teachers aren't being evaluated, there's self-evaluation every day. And I don't know of one teacher that wants a kid to fail. I, I, the, the biggest, hardest thing for me was to sit there and, and fail a kid on a test. All right? When I had a kid that failed a test, you know, what I would do is sit him down with me and go over the questions. And you would find nine times out of ten that he understood it. He understood the lesson, or she understood the lesson, you know, but they got the wrong answer on the test. And the test wasn't an example of what knowledge that child actually got. Absolutely. I don't know if I'm wrong, or, but that's the way I felt. And it was so hard for me to fail a kid on a test. I know of no teachers who won't bend over backwards to help every kid that's there do as whatever they can. And poverty is a big thing. Nobody's taken any of that into consideration. And quite frankly, you know, my biggest fear, two tiers of education. The tier that the people with the money can go to whatever school they want to go, and the public school tier that's been squeezed dry, and that's where everybody else ends up. Let's not let that happen, all right? Let's stop this train before it crashes. Thank you.